The following content is not suitable for children. Let's talk about killjoy, the <laughs> negative cycle okay. that squashes the love life of so many millions of couples out there and how we can get them to name that, notice it, and do it differently. How's that sound, Lori? Sounds good. Welcome to Foreplay Radio, Couples and Sex Therapy. I'm Lori Watson, your sex therapist. And I'm George Fallon, your couples therapist. And we are passionate about talking about sex and helping you develop a way to talk to each other. Our mission is to help our audience develop a healthier relationship to sex that integrates the mind, the heart, and the body. Just as we begin, please remember to check out Uberlube. Uberlube.com is where you can get this great lubricant and help support Foreplay Radio. All right. The you know, typical pattern we're going to see is therapists, you know, trying to get couples to start seeing a bigger picture, to start to see the dynamics they're caught in instead of just seeing their own kind of experience. So let's call Mary and Joe. Mary and Joe. Mary and Joe. Good Catholic well, names. All right. We got Joe, who in this case is this sexual pursuer. That's his way of connecting. He thinks about it. It's a healthy way of him feeling safe and connected. Sexual discrepancies are the most common thing we're going to see. Over 80% of couples are going to find themselves in a dynamic where one wants more and one wants less. So this is par for the course. If you're signing up for a relationship, this is coming for you. Okay. All right, so Joe's in the spot of wanting it a little bit more. So he's going to be asking, and here we go. That's the pressure to Mary. Mm. What's Mary going to say? Mary's going to say, all you want is sex. Or I don't know, or some version <laughs> or of. I don't know. I don't know. She feels the pressure, but we're starting to understand and empathize with these withdrawers, right? That mm-hmm. that taking space just makes them feel safer. I don't know, not today, because maybe tomorrow I'd rather have sex when I'm in the mood where it feels beautiful like it used to be. Like, I just want to wait, right? But then what does that waiting do to Joe? Tells him that he's not desirable, he's not very attractive, that he doesn't, he's lost his mojo. All kinds of things, bad things. Right. And then Joe's frustration and resentment vibe just grows. Mm-hmm. And even when he's asking, he's asking a way to say, well, what about tonight, honey? Tells him right? he's not getting any, too. <laughs> Can I just say that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's it's hard not to be frustrated when you want something natural and healthy and your partner doesn't seem to want it. And mm-hmm. you try to say it the right way, wait for the right time. And the results just aren't there so successfully. True, true. Right, so Poor Joe's Joe. frustration vibe just grows, which mm-hmm. does what to uh, Mary's libido? Kills it because all she feels is his anger and this pressure and that she's failing mm-hmm. and she's not a very good wife. She's not a very good sexual partner. And then she finally says, you know what? It's not worth it. Let's just have sex even if I'm not in, in a in mood for it. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Okay, can we do it quick? Can we do it quick? <laughs> Can we get it over with? <laughs> right. Which then does what to Joe? Totally deflating. You I mean, know, it's like still nice to have, you'll take it over nothing. You take right? it but over nothing. <laughs> you take it over nothing. It gives you a little release. Uh-huh. But again, it's not an ideal situation. And before you know it, you're right back in this frustration, resentful place. And then what does Mary feel like? She feels like no matter what I do, it doesn't make him happy. You know? I gave him sex for crying out loud, and is he happy? No. So she gets set in her her own defensive posture, like I can't, I can't do it right. So why try? I think she starts to feel hopeless and gives up on trying. And that couple is stuck in a feedback loop. Yes, they are. Where Joe's frustration feeds Mary's avoidance, and Mary's avoidance feeds Joe's frustration. And I just want to put a tiny word in here for the female <laughs> sexual pursuers. We know you're out there, too. We're, we're going stereotypical today, but somebody just actually, Ryan Reina just said to me, you know, you always talk about it from the male perspective. Why don't you ever mention the female sexual pursuers? I'm like, yeah, that's right. We need to say that. Right. So, Great. again, change the genders, change the names. But the Whatever feedback you need loops to do. are the same. They are. So that's really what I want our listeners to do, if you notice your, your cycle and it might 
changed at different points in your your relationship. Right. What is common that there is a feedback loop? What can you like this couple, Mary and Joe, named it Killjoy. That's what it did for both of them. <laughs> right. But there's something really Killjoy. fun about naming it. Negative cycle, the merry go round, groundhog stay, whatever l- word you want to come up with. But the beautiful thing about doing that is it starts to externalize the problem. The problem isn't Joe. The problem isn't Mary. The problem is the dynamics that have kind of they've kind of unconsciously just created in this just attempts to be with each other. And what I like to reassure people is Everybody goes through this cycle. I mean, mm-hmm. it's emotionally or sexually. Most people, it's both. We all go through the negative cycle. It's part of growing up in a relationship. You know, how do we find and see our partner's needs and concerns that stop the cycle? In the beginning, all we see is what they're doing to us, that it's yep. their problem, that they've got to change. I can always see a path for people, like how it could be different. The difficulty, I I believe, is convincing each of them that it's not just their partner that needs to change. It's like they need to see it differently. That's the whole key to a cycle. Both people have to take responsibility for their moves. And their moves aren't wrong or bad. They make absolute sense. Mm -hmm. But you got to start to see that bigger picture. It's like when you're playing tennis and somebody hits the ball so fast to you. You just see the ball and you respond. right? But if you zoomed up to like a stadium view, you can see that every time the guy the, or the lady hits the ball, it goes in that corner. It's really predictable that that's where you're going to backhand it back to them. And, mm-hmm. and this process that moves so fast starts to slow down. Mm-hmm. So the beauty of a cycle isn't most of the time you can't stop it or catch it as it's happening. But afterwards, the next day, an hour later, you can just say, hey, we did it again. That's what starts this repair process. Right, Joe and Mary can come back to each other and say, "Hey, didn't we? We did kill Joy again, didn't we? You were frustrated. I didn't want to deal with it, right? And we we did our thing, and we know where that leads. That's the thing with a negative cycle. Both people lose. There is no winner here. There is no winner. Both people get blocked and they get into disconnect, and they're separate from each other in that sad place. Exactly, and it's what that makes that sad, judge- unsexy place. And it's what makes change so difficult because all one person has to do is their move and the other one, even if they're trying to do it differently, are going to get pulled right back into that dynamics. Mm -hmm. So imagine Joe saying, you're right, I can't be so frustrated. I got to try differently. And Joe starts to joke around and starts to be playful and, you know, and Mary just still doesn't engage. Mm -hmm. Joe's going to get pulled right back into the frustration. Mm -hmm. Or say Mary says, all right, you know what? I got to try. I got to initiate. I got to do more. Mary kind of shows up saying, hey, and she tries to initiate and Joe doesn't have to trust. And he's, he's like, really? Why now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I why love, finally? I, I love that one, especially when I finally get the sexual withdrawal to start to initiate. And their partner is like, you're just doing it because the therapist suggested it. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding? All that work down the drain. <laughs> you know, it's just another way that they block it. I'm like, no, 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 you know, no, she doesn't really want to do it or he doesn't really want to do it. So every pursuer listening (laughs) needs to kind of just take that moment, put yourself aside and be your withdrawn partner that wants to say, I don't know, that wants to go away. What is it like to actually initiate? How risky is that? And what is it like when you do and your partner can't respond to it? What does that do to you? It's terrible terrible so you're asking the then the pursuer who just had their partner initiate to remember that to remember that remember how bad it feels the felt sense of that and how not trying actually is a better option than that feeling Mm -hmm. it's so hard for a pursuer to get why the withdrawer doesn't want to try doesn't want to engage but that's a great feeling to carry with you to say if you run the risk of that happening No wonder why they'd rather play it safe and take space because that is so tried and true for them. You're saying what I've always felt for people is that sexual frequency, it just can't be negotiated, right? It can't be you want it five times a week and I want it once, so let's do it two or three times a week. And, you know, it's it's not going to work. 
It's like we have to walk into each other's hearts and feel something from them about what it's like, what it's like to have it, what it's like to not have it, what it's like to initiate, what it's like to risk, all of that. That's, there's a deeper place that we get to in understanding with each other that really creates a bond. And then what I see in couples is it's kind of magical. It doesn't, they're not mm-hmm. negotiating anymore. They're responding to each other about feelings. It's like if their partner says, you know, you want to do it tonight, and, and they don't. But they care so much about, Mary cares so much about Joe. Right? She's like, honey, I'm exhausted, but I could hold you, or, you know, you could do you and I could hold you, or something. I, I know you want to be connected to me. It's like they see the longing, and they respond to that. Exactly. It's great. And I don't want to leave these pursuers feeling left out. The withdrawers need to do the same thing. If you're a withdrawer, listen, and I want you to put yourself aside and just get curious how many times does that pursuer want to engage and initiate but doesn't, that tries not to put pressure. And just to feel what that does for the pursuer. This is my very favorite thing you say, George. Whenever I've listened to you, any class, anything, that is so true for the pursuer. It's like, you don't know how good I've been. I haven't pressured you. I haven't asked in all this time and now the one time I ask and you say I ask all the time it's like you have no idea what I'm really thinking that, that and what is- does it do when you're holding that space and you're, you want to engage and you're trying to hold it back and then your partner just walks away and says yeah not now not interested don't want to engage just to feel that protest inside of you that it feels so unfair that you've tried so hard to say it right to wait for the right time and yet it's so easily kind of put aside by your partner Mm -hmm. and you know and your body just wants to kind of protest that Mm -hmm. or worse you come up to them and touch them and they kind of stiffen oof so painful So when we come back from break, we're going to get into some concrete moves that both of them can do. Okay. To unite against the killjoy. Reunite against killjoy. Yes. We are grateful to UberLube for still sponsoring us. This is a fantastic lube. If you haven't tried it yet, please check it out at uberlube.com with the coupon foreplay, which gives you 10% off. I keep forgetting to tell people that. They can support us and they can try this great lubrication, which is really, it's made out of a high grade silicone. And, you know, I do all kinds of ratings on lubrications just in my work and silicone doesn't get absorbed into the body. So it, it really provides smooth touch, smooth intercourse, a great glide. It's scent free. It is taste free. So you can switch from foreplay to oral sex to intercourse with no problem. Well, if you're using Uber Lube to enhance and relax your body, then it's just that much easier to open up your mind and expand your heart. And having something fun that makes sex even better, I would love for you to try Uber Lube. Support the Foreplay podcast and save 10% off your order when you use the coupon code FOREPLAY at uberlube.com done two Facebook Lives for our patrons, George, and we try to do that once a quarter. We try to send newsletters and give exclusive material, but it's really, we are grateful for people who believe in our mission to help couples keep it hot and help inform people and help them talk about sex, help them get better at their sexual relationship. Right, and partnering with us is it's really an honor to know people are joining us on this mission that this is a an effort to produce and for the listeners to put aside time and, and we hope that's valuable but when, when we join forces it's just a lot easier to get that message out there so we so appreciate the support both financial and just to make those ratings and to spread the word because mm-hmm. our world really needs it it does and We get so many letters from people, not just patrons, that are grateful for what we're doing and say it's changing their lives. And so if you want to help us change the world, we would appreciate that support. And certainly this is something that our hearts are in and we've given a lot to you and you can join with us. George, I love what you're saying. The mercy that you have for the pursuers, that is Mm -hmm. good, about especially the how many times we think about it, think about sex or think about the desire for emotional connection and 
don't bring it up. And then when we're turned down or if we're a withdrawer and we feel so much pressure and we're so afraid that the cycle is going to start that we stiffen up and shut down. And, and this cycle, the killjoy cycle between couples, how each of them has a part. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to give people other moves that they can make so that they can reach connection and they can unite against the cycle, the bad cycle. Yeah, I love Sue Johnson's line where she says the negative cycle is rigidly maintained by each partner's ways of managing disconnection while searching for closeness. Right? Both say, the pursuer, both the pursuer and withdrawer are trying to manage, protect themselves from the disconnection, from the hurt, from the mistrust, right? So the withdrawer needs to take space. The pursuer is trying to kind of push the envelope. Those are just survival moves that they learned before they were with each other. Mm -hmm. And yet in these moves, they're also trying to search for closeness. They're trying to figure out how to do it differently. So we're really trying to get them to see this bigger picture because that's all survival does. It gives both partners tunnel vision. Right? When you're in tunnel vision, you just know what the other person's doing is not working and it's hurting you. It's really hard to see your part take ownership for your move and what it's doing to create the very thing in your partner that you don't like. Right? So the worst thing for a withdrawer is criticism. Well, guess what? That's the go-to move of a pursuer. That's, that's their right? go-to. Criticism and anger. Right. right? The worst Ramp thing for up. a pursuer is withdrawal, distance. Silence. The drawers are excellent. <laughs> They're masters at that move. Oh, Can yeah. you start taking ownership for your move, although it makes absolute sense, is really, really terrible. It can be traumatic for your partner. And usually when I tell couples this the first time, they look at you with like deer in headlights and say, uh-oh, then, then are we wrong for each other? Like, are we just doomed? Is it just like there's no hope? No. You can learn to replace that negative cycle with a positive cycle. That's so true. I talked to an individual therapist this week with one of my couples. I, I'm in contact with the individual therapist, and I'm in contact with the withdrawers individual therapist. And he was like, do you not know how scathing she is to him? Are you not addressing that in therapy? And, you know, I think from either perspective, it looks so bad. But I, I think oftentimes, especially in therapy, the pursuer is exasperated and they're angry, they're criticizing. You know, it in the beginning looks obvious what they're doing to create the problem. And I think the withdrawing side, it doesn't look obvious. The silence, the quiet, the logical response, the calm, which can be infuriating to their pursuer, just looks so, especially to a therapist, maybe not trained in the cycle, you know, can look like, you know, this person's the reasonable person. They, yep. they don't see how the silence is maddening, how the withdrawal is hurting and wounding. And it's accuracy that I... It's just, it's a limited view. There is truth to that person's experience that, you know, the other partner is too critical or the other partner is not engaging. If you just listen to that side of the story, you're going to get pulled into them and believe that is the whole story. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're trying to offer is something bigger than that. So to me, there are two parts of, of really uniting against the cycle. One is understanding the good reason for your moves. So the pursuer has to understand that criticism. The withdrawer needs to understand their avoidance. And again, for all our listeners, it's not so simple. We all do some of both, but we're just trying to kind of get us, make this simpler. Mm -hmm. The next step, which is really how you know a couple is united against the cycle, is can they really see their partner's behaviors differently? So if I'm the withdrawer and you're the pursuer, Lori, I used to think your kind of pursuit to talk about sex, to want to have sex, was telling me I was doing it wrong all the time. And that's how I would then want to take space. But now I'm starting to understand that your, your pursuing is, is your hope that things are going to change. It's your fight for the relationship. It's your, it's your longing to have more in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So I'm really starting to kind of understand your move a little bit better. Mm. That's good. That feels good. 
You know, I, I used to think that when you would say no and shut down that I guess I, I told myself I wasn't good enough for you, wasn't attractive enough that, you know, if I had been like Betsy Sue in your, you know, old days, high school days, you'd have wanted it because you told me you guys did it all the time. And so I, I would just, I would start to feel bad. And I know that there's a lot of reasons that you don't want to now. I know you're really stressed out. And I know sometimes you worry about your erections and it's like that kills you if I'm spontaneous and you worry about that. I know there's a lot of reasons. I, I know you, sometimes you worry about how it goes for me and and that I'm just going to get mad. You know, so I, I get why you withdraw and, you know, why you don't necessarily talk about it because you don't want to have a big fight with me. Mm. No, it feels good. It's not that I don't care, right? It's that I just don't want to get it wrong. And going mm -hmm. away is a guarantees I don't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I, I want to tell you you're not doing enough. I, actually, I want more of you. I mean, it's, it's not like you're failing me. It's that I just feel so hungry to be with you. Ooh. Right. Well, you can see how easy we fall into this loop. Yes. And that's the thing. You're never going to make this cycle disappear. It always comes back. The whole idea is when it comes back, can you notice it and have a conversation that gets you back on track? That's why naming it, I really listen to please name your cycle. Don't just sit back and say, all right, it's, this makes sense. We have something like it. No, you need to actually name it. Take a minute or two just to find a special word, something that reminds you, you know. This is a me, great, great thing. I like this idea. Oh, me and my wife would have the same fight every year in California, so we would just call it California. <laughs> right? As we were traveling there, we knew it was coming for us. <laughs> Did you say? But there was something about we're going to do California. Let's talk about it now, right? And it made a big <laughs> difference in those future trips, uh -huh. right? So what is what might be a, a name of a cycle with you and your husband? Gosh, I got to think about that, George. I have not, I have not named our cycle. Drowning. <laughs> Drowning. Um, Your husband's a, a swimmer, <laughs> so we just try to come up He's with something. He's drowning. <laughs> well, He's sure, drowning it doesn't sound so good. But the whole idea is when you make it personable, mm -hmm. when it's an image, when it's something vivid and in real clear color, like you hold on to that. It's so much easier for your brain to access that, you know, in times There's of stress. There's a tiny bit of humor in it. Right. right. And it's outside of us. It's our third part. I think that's what's powerful, too, is to think this is something that grabs us. It's not It's not my heart. You mm -hmm. know, I want to be connected with my partner. It's not their heart. They want to be connected to me. They want to please me, all that. But this thing, this kind of monstrous thing comes in the way of and gets in the way of us and grabs us, sucks us down the drain, drowns us. Drowns I'll try us. that. I'll try right. it. And what's so beautiful about the simplicity of the cycle is – if you see what's wrong, right, which is here, the message they're failing and pressure, the pursuers feeling the rejection and the sense that, you know, they're not wanted and they protect themselves with that anger, it tells us what both people need, right? So if I'm a pursuer, I know my withdrawer is feeling a sense of failure and that's why they're going away. How do I give them a sense of success? in these conversations, in these encounters? How do I empower them? If they feel pressure, how do I help them be more curious and open? Mm -hmm. The flip side of that, if I'm a withdrawer, I understand how do I help my partner feel chosen and wanted and desired, right? How important is my initiation for doing that? If space is the trigger, how do I show them a different move from that space? Mm -hmm. Now we're starting to talk about those positive cycles, getting that withdrawer to initiate more, getting that pursuer to come across in a more curious, open way. Mm -hmm. Right. The withdrawer has to come forward and nurture, care, step into the space, and, and the pursuer has to stay calm and believe, you know, have a little faith, right, that their partner does want to be close well, and the irony is how do you learn that is through the mistakes and the misattunement. It's like they try, they build a little bit of positive momentum, and here comes the negative cycle again.
that's not a sign that they couple can't do it. These setbacks are opportunities to say, hey, we did it again. We it's get to so practice hard. drowning again. Right. We get to practice drowning again. We get again. to practice California Sounds like again. fun. Sounds every, like fun. Every year. But each time, the hope is you get better and better at saying, it is so hard. I'm a withdrawer. It is so hard for me if I'm not intentional to resist the urge to just say, I don't know, and move away. Mm-hmm. But I am starting to get that every time I do that, although it feels safe in a moment, I know in the long term it just creates more distance for us. And it really sends you to a bad place. And I'm sorry I did it again. Mm-hmm. What do you think that would be like to hear? I feel really good. Oh, I'm please sorry. return the favor. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I push you. But I, I make you not feel safe. And I know, you know, that I do that and I get really critical. And I get all ramped up and all that energy just, you know, pushes you back. You know, I'm sorry to do that to you because I, I want to be somebody that you feel safe with. Mm. You, you can come to. It's nice. You know when you can give your partner permission. I don't like your move, but it makes sense. If you're not feeling so safe, I get why you get angry. I get why you go away. When a partner can say that, that's what the repair process looks like. We did it again. We fell into the California. We started drowning again. We did kill joy again. Whatever the name is, Mm -hmm. it's just a bid to come back together and repair. And that, again, is the only difference between the best couples and couples that don't make it is that ability to notice distance and to be able to repair it. We all get into the cycle. We all do the thing that is going to push our partner away. It's getting back together. That's That's important. If it wasn't for the negative cycle, there'd be no makeup sex. So we need it. (laughs) Thanks for listening to 4Play Radio. Keep it hot, everyone. Makeup sex. Yeehaw. And P.S., please tune in to our Patreon page so that you can catch the next exclusive episode and our next Facebook Live. We appreciate you joining us to spread this really important message. Call in your questions to the 4Play Question voicemail. Dial 833-MY-4PLAY. That's 833, the number 4, PLAY. And we'll use the questions for our mailbag episodes. All content is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered as a substitute for therapy by a licensed clinician or as medical advice from a doctor.